All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are uh, joining this webinar from. Uh, welcome to today's webinar on uh, multi-asset credit markets and ESG. I think this topic is very timely, considering that uh, credit markets are uh, at crossroads uh, with, with expectations of rate hikes this year. I'm sure our audience is very keen to understand implications of uh, potential rate hikes on a balance 60-40 uh, uh, equity bond portfolios and how alternative credit can optimize risk and reward. I mean, I'm personally also very curious to learn how EST is embedded into your investment process. And uh, you know, how do we have a sizable ESG investment universe? Do we have a sizable investment universe for credit markets? Uh, my name is Vijay Harpalani. I'll be joining this event today. Uh, host, sorry, I'll be hosting this event today. This webinar is co-hosted by CFA Emirates and uh, Blue Bay Asset Management, uh, which is a subsidy of uh, Royal Bank of Canada and uh, managing about $80 billion uh, in credit markets globally. CFA Emirates, uh, I won't uh, spend much time at it needs no introduction, but as you are aware, we are a local chapter of CFA Institute with about uh, 1,000 uh, uh, members. And our goals are to facilitate your uh, continued professional learning and enable networking opportunities. Today's presentation is uh, scheduled for one hour with uh, you know first 30 to 35 minutes dedicated to presentation, followed by 25, 30 minutes of Q&A. After the presentation is concluded, we will open the floor to questions. Uh, please do submit your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll be addressing them uh, uh, in the last 25 to 30 minutes, but feel free to jump in anytime, you know, by the way. So we would also uh, welcome your feedback on this webinar and uh, feel free to tell us which other topics uh, you're also interested in. Please welcome Mr. Bear Reed, uh, partner, senior portfolio manager, uh, multi-asset credit, and he is also a member of the asset allocation committee with the Blue Bay Asset Management. I would also welcome uh, his colleague, uh, Abilek, Abileka Jain, who heads up uh, sales for the UK and Ireland at Dubai Asset Management. Over to you, Blair. Um, well, well, actually, would you like to um, start, Abby? Sure, I'm gonna turn my camera off because I know my, my Wi-Fi is, is, is playing up today. Uh, but uh, good evening, everyone. And thank you, CFA and Red Society for providing us this platform of your evening. Uh, with us. Um, well, that hasn't worked quite as well, I hope. As I kind of, um, uh, Abby, Abby, it's before just before I pass it, Abby, it's just cutting out a bit much. Maybe a couple of just two minutes on us. Abby, I don't know if you can hear me, it's just cutting out a little bit too much. So, so perhaps um, it, it, might, it might be easier if I begin. So apologies, I think Abby um, seems to- So maybe Blair, I'll just pass it on to you. Sure, um, and, and so apologies. It, it seems the, um, the, the Wi-Fi um, is, is not as strong. Um, Blair, as... I'm gonna pass it on to you. Okay, that's no problem, Abby. Um, so apologies, um, not, not off to the easiest uh, start there. Um, but what Abby was gonna say uh, is um, certainly thank you um, for having us along today. Um, I've bought, um, far too many pages um, than we can probably possibly present um, easily. But I thought it'd be interesting to do just a number of different things. Um, so there is a little quiz question to start. Um, there's a little bit on multi-asset credit um, for those of you that are less familiar. Uh, a little bit about what we think of markets um, and I'll stop and um, given Vijay's questions, I'm happy to take some questions at that point. Um, and because it is the CFA, um, there's an educational um, part in the middle, and it tries to analyze um, how we think about markets and uh, to, I, I guess, briefly introduce it. Uh, a lot of investors focus on the average yield uh, of an asset class. So um, I only deal in bonds, um, so there won't be any equities today. Um, but there are anything about the average yield. Um, and the average tells you something, but it doesn't tell you uh, an awful lot. Uh, so uh, we have some analysis to, to think more deeply about how the different asset classes um, actually look. Um, and again, as per Vijay's um, introduction, the, the last bit, we'll talk a little bit about ESG. Uh, a lot of our clients um, have been uh, going down the ESG road. Uh, like many managers, uh, we've launched some, some ESG products. And uh, it's just a little bit about how do we actually take that into account? You know, what extra do you do? Um, if you're doing uh, an ESG product. So that's, that's where we're going to finish. Um, 
it, it probably is about 30 minutes all up um, if, if I go quickly. Um, but as I said, I will, um, I'll pause along the way um, if, if there is any questions. Now I'm gonna share my screen hopefully successfully uh, and that IT will work. So I found the presentation, control, uh, click on that, control L. Now, hopefully um, that's full screen. Yeah, that, that looks good to me. Um, so um, I'm gonna um, start with this little quiz question, um, which is a little bit hard and I, I can't see the chat box, but uh, the, um, the, there's a couple of slides here just on thinking about changing economics. And one question for you um, and a good way to think about it is if you stacked US national debt, uh, would you actually get to the moon? Now, the, uh, and this is in $5 bills, sorry, I should be very specific. Now, when I'm asking this in the UK, so there are some clues, when I'm asking this in the UK, uh, I ask in one pound coin. So if you've been on holiday here, you know the one pound coin. Uh, I ask the question, you know, if you stack UK national debt in one pound coins, would you get to the moon? Uh, the answer is absolutely yes. And then the question is how many times? Uh, and with a little bit of guessing, um, you soon get to 13. So it's, it's a lot. The, um, in notes, obviously, uh, it, it's not as easy. Um, and, and to give you the answer, usually there is some guessing. Um, and uh, the answer is, yeah, um, you would actually get to the moon if you stack US national debt in $5 bills. Not only do you get to the moon, uh, you get about 60 or 65% of the way um, back as well. It's a tremendous uh, amount of money. Um, I recommend that there's a website called the US Debt Clock, which, which um, is a wonderful thing to watch counting. Um, but if you have a look at the numbers on the US Debt Clock, the, um, the, the ones I focus on is the effectively the US national debt per citizen uh, at the moment sits about $90,000, um, which is quite a bit. Um, in the right hand side, they, they generally have the revenue, tax revenue and things like that. Uh, revenue per citizen in the US is only about $12,000. Um, so uh, you kind of owe 90 uh, and, and are getting in 12. Uh, and so if you were taking out a mortgage, you probably wouldn't give a mortgage on that basis. So um, it, it's a lot. Um, and, uh, and the reason to put that there uh, is, is it has changed economic thinking. And just the, I, I guess the last page in the introduction, I'll try and keep this quick, but the, um, it's certainly our view that underlying economics has changed a little. So um, to, to give you a, a sense of my age, I started work in uh, the very early 90s, and uh, it was in the Reagan-Volcker era in terms of economic management. And the thinking always was that, quite successfully, um, that we would manage an economy in terms of growth and inflation, uh, and in the US unemployment as well, um, by controlling the private cost of borrowing effectively. So I can change the private cost of borrowing with interest rates um, that'll increase or dampen demand, uh, and that's how I'm gonna manage my economy. And it worked really well, um, generally speaking, um, up until COVID. And COVID, um, which is the right-hand side here, has really ushered in uh, a new era uh, in, in how to think about underlying economics. And, and that is because um, what we can now do, and part of this is technology related, is through um, furlough programs or um, helping individual sectors, um, governments can effectively transfer money um, to people uh, or businesses um, and balance up those parts of aggregate demand that are lacking um, in a downturn. So rather than the very blunt instrument of monetary policy, changing rates, um, we can be really laser focused uh, and actually more accurately uh, manage an economy. Uh, and I think going forward, you'll, you'll see a lot more of that. Um, it has an impact on default rates, which we'll come to. Uh, if you'd asked me at the beginning of COVID, what would default rates be? Uh, I would have guessed high. <laughs> and, uh, and they should be high, uh, except they're actually incredibly low. Uh, and they're incredibly low because um, on the right-hand side of this page, we've changed the way um, that we think about managing economies. So um, on a go-forward basis, um, particularly, um, I, I'm guessing, I can't see you, but I'm, I'm guessing at your average age, um, it's going to be a, a different career uh, in, in terms of how economies are managed going forward than it has been for me. So you're going to see central banks um, probably play less of a role, uh, in all honesty, going forward, uh, and governments through fiscal transfers are actually doing an awful lot more. Uh, and, and this has a lot of impact, uh, obviously, on credit markets. So that's a, a quick introduction um, to the way the world um, is going. The next little section uh, is four slides on multi-asset credit. So this is my day job. Um, this is what I do. Uh, multi-asset credit is, uh, as, as the name suggests, 
uh, investing across all the different asset classes within credit to build a portfolio. So a lot of Blue Bay investors um, have just investment grade or just emerging markets, for example, uh, but a growing number of investors um, give us money to invest across um, that spectrum. Uh, I won't run through all the asset classes. You can see them here from, from high yield to emerging markets on the right-hand side, uh, Cocos convertibles. Um, it's effectively, if it's publicly traded, so we're not doing private assets, if it's publicly traded, we'd include it. And at the top of page six there, you can see the definition of how we think about multi-asset credit. So it's generally uh, a collection of these asset classes. Uh, often investment grade plays a smaller role. Um, so it's often quite a bit of sub-investment grade. The, the overall yield or target yields tend to be that little bit higher. And there's generally an asset allocation framework, uh, and that's the key. So one of the attractions of multi-asset credit certainly from an investor's perspective, uh, is the manager is deciding how much high yield, how much emerging markets, how much convertible bonds, uh, rather than the investor um, having to make those decisions. And it's just a lot quicker. So we're, we've been, I guess, in many ways, the beneficiary uh, of clients, particularly a lot of US clients with more complicated large pension funds, uh, deciding to outsource that asset allocation decision. So that, that is key to multi-asset credit. Um, multi-asset credit uh, is something that's been around for quite a long time, uh, but it's changed. And, uh, and this particular timeline is a, a very brief snippet uh, of our journey. Um, and on the left-hand side there, um, older style multi-asset type funds tended to be fund of funds uh, and a little bit um, clunky or slow to move money between these asset classes because uh, not everything's a daily fund. Uh, they, they sometimes had a benchmark, um, which made them pretty inefficient, to be honest. So your, your safe place or your anchor wasn't always a great place to be. And it was really from probably 2012 to 2014, quite a lot of investment managers, including us, um, went down a path of a new version of multi-asset credit with, with a lot more flexibility than the past had, had given us. And part of that was we weren't sure where the world was going and, and building something more flexible and future-proof seemed a sensible thing to do. Uh, and touch wood, that, that's, that's been absolutely true. So on, on this particular chart, we have it in 2013. <clears throat> and the key is um, they typically are cash benchmarked. So it's cash plus something uh, in terms of return target. Uh, and, and no benchmark uh, and no fund of funds. So they're typically today managed in one pot uh, and nearly all the mainstream asset managers um, offer one. Um, there's a lot of different types. Um, and so on 2019 there, um, you can see uh, it says leverage financed Mac. Um, we have several different versions. Um, the one I'm gonna talk about today, uh, particularly at the end is, is a broader version that goes anywhere, um, but there are also narrower versions um, which, which are uh, centered around high yield and loans and structured credit. So when you look at different manager offerings in multi-asset credit, um, it's very hard to compare because everybody is different, all trying to do the same general thing, uh, but with different mixes and different asset classes. Um, and that's absolutely key. On the right-hand side, um, which is also where we'll finish today, uh, a little bit on Mac ESG. So uh, again, a number of managers, including us, um, now have ESG versions uh, of these Mac strategies. And we see uh, a real transition for investors in thinking about, well, uh, is it worthwhile moving to an ESG version? How much do I give up in yield, uh, if anything, and what are the different characteristics? And, and indeed, that's where, uh, as I said, we'll finish today. Um, and just the last slide on, on this Mac introduction. Um, I, I call this our recipe. Um, every manager has a different one. Um, but for our standard go anywhere type multi-asset credit, just to give you some idea, uh, the left-hand side uh, is, is how we think about it. So it's five points here. Uh, best ideas essentially means it's not benchmarked, so we're only going to include things we really, really like. Uh, it's active in terms of asset allocation. Uh, we also hedge rising rates. Um, so uh, to uh, Vijay's question earlier on, I'm happy to um, tackle that. Um, part of multi-asset credit is, is not only um, all these asset classes we see here, uh, it's thinking about how to protect the capital that, that investors have, um, have given us. And uh, hedging interest rates is, um, is very important. Uh, at the moment, it's something uh, we and other multi-asset credit managers do. And uh, at the moment, um, we have hedged off all the US interest rate risk in the fund. So um, we'll come on in, in a second, have a look at the, the actual mix of assets. The, the natural duration or interest rate sensitivity of these type of portfolios is generally somewhere between three and five years. Um, the published numbers overestimate the interest rate sensitivity. Um, because standard duration calculations 
uh, don't allow for higher spread bonds, which are less interest rate sensitivity sensitive, so they tend to overestimate it a little bit. Um, but it is possible through um, hedging US Treasury futures to, to hedge out a lot of that. So, uh, and we did, and that's worked incredibly well this year. Um, so uh, this year, you've seen quite a bump uh, in the US 10 year. Uh, for our multi-asset credit fund, it was it was insulated from that. Um, and so, although markets haven't been all that kind uh, so far this year, we certainly haven't suffered um, as far from rising rates. So, so just to touch on being active. Um, this particular version, back on the left-hand side there at number three, uh, it targets cash plus four to six, uh, generally 150 to 250 issuers across all the different asset classes. Uh, and number five ESG um, is obviously a key part of it. Uh, and the right-hand side uh, is, is the limits per asset class. And so um, most multi-asset credit funds are not um, absolute go anywhere. They, they typically have ranges uh, and the ranges are there to ensure a manager is diversified. So you just can't pick one thing. So it's a pretty long list of asset classes, uh, different limits depending on, on really the risk contribution of the different asset class. For example, convertible bonds in the middle, uh, a lot more volatile uh, and, and contributes a lot more risk than something like bank loans, for example. Uh, but we really want to balance it up. So again, all multi-asset credit funds, slightly different recipe, um, but that is our standard recipe. And as a representative uh, of, of quite a lot of multi-asset credit funds um, in, in, of this type. Um, so I'm just going to do a couple more pages uh, and then I'll have my uh, first little pause um, in case you have any questions. So sorry, I didn't present this one. Um, so so um, page nine uh, is the asset allocation uh, as well, looking back um, on our, again, the standard strategy going back to, uh, to 2013. Um, so, so quarterly snapshots here. And um, when investors um, or prospects look at this, um, you can get some sense of the rate of change of asset allocation. So um, one thing that constrains us from being overly active is quite simply the cost of trading. Uh, so it's expensive to buy and sell a bond. Um, if we want to um, sell and buy a different high yield bond, for example, it can cost between 50 and 50 and 100 basis points to actually do so. So it's not cheap to move between some of the asset classes. And so we would describe it, um, certainly in nautical or boating terms, as a gentle hand on the tiller. Um, you want to gradually move towards the asset classes you like. Um, you want to sometimes be a little bit aggressive moving away from ones you don't. Um, so the light blue, I don't know if you can see my little hand waving on the screen here, uh, but the light blue is emerging market local currency, um, something we're out of in the early COVID period uh, and something we sold out of in the middle uh, of last year uh, and haven't, haven't re-engaged with yet. So the great thing about Mac as well um, is, is you have the ability to be out of uh, an asset class. Um, investment grade, as I said, generally doesn't feature. Um, that there is, a, um, I guess, an exception. Again, if you can see my little hand there in Q1 2020 and Q2, uh, in, in the early COVID period, um, we effectively de-risked a lot of the fund. Uh, and uh, at that point, um, investment, particularly in those first couple of weeks um, of the COVID crisis, uh, investment grade issuers desperate to raise money uh, were doing so crazy spreads uh, and we took advantage. So, um, and a lot of those bonds we bought, and this was uh, even 3M, uh, making the masks issued. Um, you could generally buy at 100, buy at par, um, and six months later, you could sell these bonds for 130. Um, so some uh, great opportunities um, thrown up by COVID in the investment grade space. But, but hopefully that gives you some sense, uh, at least of the rate of change uh, on a quarterly basis of these types of portfolios. Uh, and as I said, just, just a couple of slides and then I'll have a brief pause. So um, active use um, is obviously important to people. And uh, what you see here on page 11, uh, and this was snapshot at the end of the year, obviously it's changed a little bit. Um, yields for the US on the left-hand side are a bit higher today. Um, what, what I'm really focused on generally is, is the spread. So obviously risk-free uh, rates move up and down around the world. Um, as a bond investor, you're, you're most interested in the spread generally. You know, what is that extra uh, I can get from investing in a risk-free? And uh, part of the, I, I guess, way we think about what's attractive and what's not um, is partly due to what is the average spread uh, I, I can get. And again, as I said, we'll come on and talk about all the uh, variation uh, of these. As I said, these are averages. So um, these type of levels um, we have to think about uh, against a background of targeting cash plus four to six. Uh, so we want cash plus four to six, you know, do these spreads get us there? Well, the spreads are a little bit lower today. Um, so we've got, we can take active views and, and we can do better than the underlying spreads, but there's no doubt some of these spreads have come in. And um, some of the questions I get from investors is really, you know, at what point uh, do spreads have to come in where you'd say, actually, uh, I, can't, I can't get cash plus four to six, the, you know, the extra amount of the spread is just too low. 
Um, and the, the answer is about 100 basis points lower than the figures you see here. So um, markets at the moment, you can see somewhere between three and 400 basis points in terms of spread, uh, lower than the long-term average, still attractive um, in terms of individual opportunities, uh, but those spreads uh, have definitely come in. So um, that, that is key, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. And in terms of asset class views, the way we calibrate it um, is on a minus three to plus three basis. So um, when we look at an asset class, if we think over the next six months, it will provide a return equivalent to the underlying yield, then we'll give it a zero. So if high yield was yielding 5% and we thought over six months it'll give you a 5% equivalent over that period, we give it a zero. If we think it's going to do worse, it'll get a negative. If we think it'll do better, um, it'll get a plus. <clears throat> so what you can see here uh, is, is our, our views certainly um, at the end of the year. So um, high yield where um, we still have a reasonable amount in the portfolio. Um, the reality is uh, it's, uh, it's a pretty rich place in terms of valuations. And, and we don't think spreads uh, are going to compress this year. In fact, we think they'll do the opposite. They'll probably move out a little bit. So some great individual opportunities, but the market as a whole, um, we're, we're less enamored with than what perhaps we once were. Um, loans and structured credit. Uh, and here in structured credit, um, we're really talking about primarily CLOs. And uh, we, we like them because they're interest rate insensitive. So uh, in a rising rate environment, um, bank loans, floating rate type securities generally are more attractive. Um, and that's certainly how we think about um, both of those markets. Um, Cocos or contingent convertibles, they're part of bank capital. Uh, they were a plus three. Uh, we've done very well, and they're a plus two. Uh, the most, as you can see, our favorite asset here, um, and, and certainly the most mispriced uh, in our view of all the assets we invest in. So uh, it's been a very rich vein, our biggest contributor to performance last year, and, uh, and, and I think may, may well be this year as well. Um, convertible bonds we like. Uh, convertible bonds last year um, did zero um, or even slightly negative. Uh, equity markets, as you know, went up an awful long way. Um, generally, a convertible bond market over time, over time provides roughly about 50% of that equity market performance. Um, and so we think there's quite a lot of catch up uh, in convertibles. They certainly haven't done that over the last few years. Uh, and so we think there's some good opportunities there. Uh, emerging markets, we, we don't love um, for some of the reasons I mentioned uh, previously. Uh, the strong dollar uh, is, is really against you in emerging market, local and hard currency, uh, partly the spread's coming a long way. Uh, and also there's some, um, some pretty unattractive idiosyncratic stories, uh, particularly Russia. Uh, Russia, things going on in Russia, Ukraine aren't great for sentiment. Uh, you know, everything from Venezuela to, um, there's quite a lot of South American elections this year, uh, which quite polarized uh, annoyingly. So uh, that's also not great in that space. So uh, hopefully they're a quick snapshot um, of what we think of the world. Um, the remainder of the presentation uh, is, uh, is a little bit of educational bit, uh, and as I said, ESG. So I said I would, and I'm happy to take a little pause there uh, and ask if there's any questions on active views. Uh, and if not, I will, um, I'll jump into um, the next section. But uh, VJ, if there's any questions, I'd be really happy to take them. Yeah, while we still uh, wait for the questions to arrive, but maybe there are a few questions uh, from my side. Sure. So, uh, does does you know uh, given uh, that you mentioned about the portfolio, the way you assemble it, right? Does tactical adjustment to your strategic portfolio add any value? Given that you mentioned that the cost of execution itself is quite high, you know, ranging from fifty or fifty to hundred basis points. Yeah, yeah. And, and sorry, were you saying VJ? Does the asset allocation add value? Is that the question? Uh, the tactical asset allocations in the short term, if you want to really position the portfolio to benefit from the short term trends, yeah. right? Does it add any value given the high cost of executions? Yeah. So, so the the way we we approach it, um, so so the um, the, the quick answer is active asset allocation has added value, uh, and and does tend to add value, and it then it depends how you think about it. So the way we approach it is for all our multi. I haven't put this in the presentation, but for all our multi asset credit funds. Um, we have a long-term average asset allocation, which we call the neutral asset allocation. Uh, and, and that provides something to do an attribution against uh, and also provides, you know, I, I guess, an anchor to, to allocate against. So when we're thinking about um, less high yield, more high yield, less EM, more EM, uh, we do think about it relative to that long-term average. And that's how we do um, that attribution. So when we're measuring, did we add value um, through active decisions, we, we kind of split them in three. Um, we, we ask ourselves, um, you know, given performance after fees and all the transaction costs, 
did having a different asset allocation versus that long-term average ad value, yes or no. Uh, we then attribute, did the securities we selected versus the underlying indices uh, or, or versus that, you know, all, all the things we could possibly buy, did that add value? And then we can isolate um, how much the hedges added as well. Uh, and the answer is all those things uh, in the long run have added value, um, which, is, which is great. Um, so you can add value in all of them. The, the thing with the costs is when, when you're thinking about an active decision, um, you don't want to be deciding to do something on a 50-50 um, basis because after costs, it'll just cost you money. So where we have an investment view where we're not certain it could go this way, it could go that way, uh, it's not a great place to take risk um, because net of cost, you're going to lose money. So generally speaking, you want to be um, you know, kind of 70% certain or 70% hopeful uh, something's actually going to happen before you'd actually spend the transaction cost of doing it. So that transaction cost hurdle is always there. And um, I, I guess the full answer is when we build the product, and I think this is true of other managers as well, um, we kind of set a limit on, on the level of transaction costs. So uh, in this particular fund targeting cash plus four to six, we'd be happy to be for transaction cost to be about 10% of that total. So let's say we're getting 5% on average, we'd be happy to have 50 basis points of transaction costs. And that, that's really how we calibrate that level of activity. Okay. Well, what I'll do is I'll go a bit further um, in, in terms of um, the asset classes. And, and, and this bit um, is, is based um, on a paper, um, which ironically I was editing yesterday, so it must be about to come out. So I'm sure we'll, uh, Abby will, will circulate it in due course. But it, it's about, as I said in the beginning, digging into the individual um, asset classes. and the, the, the first little part is really intro. And that is to say, when we think about credit, um, you, you have to know, I apologize for the complexity of um, this page on your screen, um, but it's, it's straight off Bloomberg, it's Bloomberg's default um, credit matrix. <clears throat> and what it does is, um, if you can see my little hand moving on the screen here, um, credit rating is obviously down the left. Um, the orange line is investment grade, sub-investment grade. Um, it gives you a long run implied probability of picking a bond of that particular credit rating at random uh, and it defaulting uh, it, it on a 12 month basis, uh, importantly. So uh, if you're AAA at the top, um, it's basically zero. Uh, as you go down, um, it becomes greater. Um, and one key takeaway on this in terms of default rates uh, is although the scale in letters is linear, uh, the probabilities are exponential. Um, so once you get down to something, as you can see here, like a triple C plus, you know, if you pick one at random, you've got a one in eight chance it's going to default uh, in the long run. Now, at the moment, default rates are lower um, than these long term averages. But again, um, something to really think about uh, in terms of how we think about credit. So when I think about multi asset credit, the average credit rating um, is generally for us double B plus. So for a lot of credit portfolios, our mainstream credit portfolios that include sub investment grade, um, you go outside investment grade, but not too far. <laughs> so once you're traveling down the bottom, uh, we typically have different funds or different, you know, distressed portfolios that people invest in. But a lot of mainstream multi-asset credit focuses at the upper end uh, of sub-investment grade. Um, in terms of what the markets are offering, and this is, again, just a little bit of background. Um, this is straight out of a um, uh, JP Morgan presentation. Um, if, if you look at something like US high yield, which a lot of people look to as a barometer, um, what you can see, <laughs> this charts the yield, uh, goes back a long way. Um, in fact, before I started work. Um, but you can see it's low uh, and um, it's ticked up a little bit. It was a few months ago. I could have said it's the lowest ever. Um, it's not quite, but it's pretty low. Uh, and two things have happened there. Obviously, risk-free rates are very low uh, and also spreads have come in a long way. So again, for an investor in these type of markets, you are really thinking about, am I being compensated enough to actually take on the risk of, of exposing myself to these particular assets? Uh, and, and spread is more useful. So this page is spread. And when we look at spread, um, as you can see, it's certainly below the, this orange line gives you a sense of what the average is. Uh, we're below uh, that long term average is not the lowest it's ever been. Um, but it's not far off. And, and so, again, you are thinking about. Um, so the broader market is rich, which is why I said in terms of valuation, why I said that earlier. But it doesn't mean we can't really find really good opportunities inside it. So as an investor, you're always really cognizant about what the averages are, um, but you really think about, can I find opportunities nonetheless? So uh, most of the markets we invest in are in a similar situation to this, where they're below uh, all these long-term averages. Uh, and in terms of defaults, um, and, and this is, it's, it's high yield and it's loans. Uh, again, JP Morgan, um, uh, I guess, famously published all this data uh, monthly, which is helpful. Um, but you can just see on this right-hand side, again, these are one-year rolling figures. 
you can see on the right hand side just how low uh, these numbers are. So historic averages uh, obviously are much higher, um, affected by the spikes. Uh, but uh, if you'd asked me where would we be now, as I said, uh, you know, at the beginning of COVID, uh, I wouldn't think I'd say, again, it's pretty much the lowest ever uh, in terms of default. So again, back to, um, I guess, changing economics. So, so this part, that's really the background. This part is, is really about this chart. So, um, and you can in many ways forget the numbers, but it's really just to say, as I mentioned, investors think about average yields. Uh, and, uh, and when we go and see investors, you know, we can't show them everything. So we're typically putting up these type of charts which says here's a whole lot of asset classes uh, and here's the average yields um, you get from investing in them. And um, you know, some are higher, some are lower, and you, you can take something away from that. And uh, if you just focus on high yield, we'll pick on high yield for our example um, and the 3.8 here. Um, if we go over the page, <clears throat> this is what we're interested in. So what is the distribution effectively around that average? Does it look like something on the left here? Again, if you can see that little hand moving where everything's kind of bunched up around the average, so not much choice. Uh, or is it really spread out? So the average is here, but actually the distribution is really, really wide. Um, and some asset classes look like the left and some look like the right. And they might have exactly the same average. Um, so that's what um, the paper and, and some of these slides deal with. So if we look specifically at US high yield, um, and so this is what the actual market looks like. It's a snapshot um, in September last year. Um, the shape doesn't change. Um, about 2000 securities on the right hand side here, average yield, median yield and duration. But what you can see is a really good spread um, around that average. So which is good from an active manager's point of view. Um, it's, it's not too bunched up. Um, and over here, we, we kind of truncate this at 12%. So it says, <clears throat> you know, some of these go out to 20 and 30%. So um, the bar for 12 plus actually much smaller than it normally is. Uh, often it's off the page. Um, but you get a sense of that dispersion uh, and it's, it's almost bell shaped, uh, ignoring that very right hand side. So um, have that in your mind, because the important bit is to then start comparing. them. The other interesting aspect, and I think this is probably almost the more interesting aspect, is, um, is this tagline at the bottom here. The credit quality um, is only loosely related um, to the yield. So um, intuitively, you probably think high yield, um, lower credit quality, if the lower the yield, you know, it's got to be a really good bond. And it's just not true. And so this is the exact same chart. If I flick between them, you can see it's the same chart. I don't know how quickly that updated on your screen. But uh, on um, if we look at double B, so again, high yield, um, they span yields from, you know, near zero um, to six, the, the single Bs, and there's the triple Cs. So if you just look at the double Bs, um, you know, you can buy one that yields two, you can buy one that yields five. Um, same kind of implied probability default, but very different yields. So uh, again, it's just to make people aware, um, you know, you, you can stick on the same credit quality and actually um, increase your yield a fair bit uh, in terms of choice. So a lot of choice uh, within a market like high yield, for example. Um, you can dig down. <clears throat> and so again, this is the same chart again on terms of high yield. Uh, the question is what companies are in this little bucket around 6% uh, and the answer is it's these. Uh, so again, if you drill down into a bucket, um, all the names obviously on the left hand side there, but if you look at the credit ratings from uh, double B plus at the bottom to triple C, uh, Viking Cruises second from the bottom uh, will give you a sense of what is in that bucket to yield about 6%. Um, but things you've probably heard of, Bombardier uh, is in there as well, Liberty Media, uh, been to the US is there as well. So. Um, companies you've heard of, and, and obviously you know, our job when we're, when we're looking at individual bonds is often to, to look inside that bucket, you know, how can I get a yield of six? Well, what would stop me picking these ones at the top versus the ones at the bottom? Uh, and that's um, a very simplistic stance, but, uh, but certainly how um, some analysts would, uh, would, would think about it. So you can really drill down. Um, if we flip to emerging markets, this is the, the very long term spread. Um, it's a hard currency market, obviously, um, like high yield, it's coming um, an awful long way. But the, the distribution, I think, is, is interesting and tells you something. So if we look at same chart as high yield, um, so yields again from minus to plus here at the bottom, uh, the heights of the bar, obviously, I should have said, tell you um, how many people, how many bonds are in that bucket. What you get um, in, in this particular market is a much bigger spread from left to right. And obviously, we've marked on some of the countries. Um, the, the key um, is um, in these numbers on the right hand side uh, and also here as well. So the average is 4.6, uh, which is fine, um, but the median is a lot lower uh, at 3.3. And, and the reason we think about this really, particularly in emerging markets is um, as an active manager, people want you to beat the average. 
and uh, and that's great. But actually, the average is quite skewed by um, Argentina, um, Lebanon, uh, some of the others often out, out on the right hand side. So that a strong right hand skew, uh, right hand tail, uh, really bumps up your average and makes it harder. So if you want to beat the average, uh, you 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 have to pick these bonds again. I hope you can see this swirling around, but you're going to have to be picking quite a lot of bonds there. Uh, and so the intuition here and, and what we try and explain to investors in, is in markets with a lot of stuff on the right hand side, the, the, the median can be a better idea of what you're likely to get um, than the average, because beating the average when there's quite risky stuff you might not want to own is, is actually quite tricky. Uh, and so again, it gives you a sense of these different distributions. Uh, if we look at local currency markets, I think this one is, uh, is the oddest, uh, almost the oddest of them all. Um, so far fewer countries here. Um, so you, you've got about 18, 20 countries um, generally in this market. Uh, what's unusual is the average is about five. Again, that's not unusual, um, but there's no bonds at five. Um, there's just hardly anybody there. So you've got on the left-hand side, a group which is kind of safer local emerging markets. You've got slightly riskier emerging markets. And then you've got uh, uh, Mr. Erdogan in Turkey um, who has a different take on economics um, than the rest of the world, uh, which, which is pushing the yields right out there. So. So again, just to show as an active manager, if people ask you to beat the average, uh, you're going to be very, um, you know, think really carefully about how you're going to approach and what you're going to buy. Uh, and are you going to go safe? Are you going to go less safe? Um, you know, Turkey's obviously impacting the average quite significantly there. And again, the median uh, is the most useful. Uh, and just a couple of slides to, to, to finish this bit up, and then I'll, I'll talk about ESG and, and, and finish up. So. Um, other markets are obviously much more bunched up. So the um, I'll, I'll do them very quickly. US Treasury market looks like this, uh, where again, same scale um, up to about 12, but everything's really bunched up on the left-hand side. Uh, if you look at US investment grade, you've got a bit, bit bigger spread, uh, but still, you know, you're, you're pretty bunched up around the middle. Uh, there's less opportunity. The, uh, the narrowest uh, of all the markets we use, uh, and this is actually quite a big, um, quite a big product for a company like Blue Bay based in Europe, um, if this is European investment grade, whew, it is really bunched up. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the spectrum or ability to, for an active manager to add value uh, is more limited because quite simply, there's not much choice. Everything in terms of yield uh, is, is really bunched up. So again, hopefully that gives you a sense of how different some of them are. Uh, and if you plot them all on one chart um, and, and adjust for different currencies, so this is all converted into USD equivalent yields, uh, you, get, you get an idea of all the things we can buy. Um, so this is investment grade on the left hand side, the high yield loans, all the stuff is in there. Uh, and there's it, a lot of choice. So I guess to, to round off the bit about multi-asset credit, um, you know, there's roughly speaking about 30, 40,000 things we can pick from uh, in terms of bonds out there. Um, typically, you're picking a couple of hundred. So you're picking a pretty narrow subset of those. Uh, and, and the choice uh, is really wide. So a lot of opportunity to add value. So uh, for all my talk about uh, markets being rich, uh, within the market, there is a tremendous uh, amount of choice. So what I might do, uh, Vijay, is I'll just do a few slides on the ESG and then we're done. Uh, and, and then we can take um, any, any questions. So that, let me just enter into this last section. So uh, as I mentioned, ESG is a big part um, of what everyone does. The way um, we approach it um, is probably slightly different to um, a lot of other managers and indeed managers have decided different things to do on ESG. Um, the, the crux of what we're doing is in this diagram with this dark blue uh, and the, the lighter blue um, diagram behind it. So when we think of an issuer, uh, and let's use, um, uh, I don't know, uh, British Petroleum, BP as an example. Um, the first thing we do is we give the issuer one of five categories, uh, which you can see here from very high to very low ESG risk. So um, something like BP is, is a high ESG risk, um, not surprisingly. Uh, something like eBay or a platform uh, is probably likely to be low or very low. So the issuer gets one. Underneath that, um, and I think this is the, um, I think the clever bit we've done, we do all the bonds separately. So that is to say, let's say um, BP has 20 different bonds on issue. Um, what we're really trying to ascertain is whether ESG in isolation is going to move the bond price. Now, for a short-term one-year bond for BP, uh, it might have very little impact, and uh, we might give it a zero, which is to say it's not going to have much of an impact. Uh, a 10-year BP bond, we might think ESG is going to play a very large part in the future of bond prices. Uh, it's going to might be a plus one or a plus two if you had a positive view, or if you're um, Exxon and you've decided you're not going to do anything, uh, then you'll get some type of minus number. So. The way to think about it is, is issue a rating uh, and then rate all the individual bonds. Uh, and that granularity allows managers, including us, to build 
you know, portfolios that really get, I think, to the heart uh, of ESG and what we're trying to aim for. Uh, we, we've recently launched a fund, as I mentioned, and um, so other managers probably approach this similarly. Um, so hopefully this is pretty generic. But the, um, the key things I think you're looking at from an ESG perspective is um, the first one is a lot of investors are looking for managers to use more of their own ESG research. So we do ESG research. Let's put more of that um, in portfolios. And I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, the middle one is engagement. Um, and uh, engagement um, certainly last year was a key theme for many of our investors. Uh, they want us to be encouraging issuers to do better uh, from an ESG perspective. We're absolutely doing that. Uh, and if all the managers do it, that's going to accelerate um, you know, everything from you know, the social, the climate, all those type of things. Um, on the right hand side, um, something um, which is mixed views with clients, um, in all honesty, um, and that is screening some things out. So there are some issuers which we just don't even include in the universe. I'll, I'll give you a, a snapshot of those in a second. Uh, most investors, if I were to go back three years ago, people were happy to screen. Uh, these days, people want to engage more and screen less. Uh, and, and indeed, our product is, is certainly built around that. So just a little bit of detail on each one. In terms of getting more research into portfolios, uh, the way we approach it, as I mentioned on the left-hand side, this is dark blue box. Uh, we give all these issuers from a very high to a very low uh, if it's very high, if we think it's very high ESG, it's quite simply we don't buy it. Uh, if we think it's high, uh, we might buy it, uh, but we're not going to buy much of it. And you're only going to be a high if you're improving, improving rapidly. Uh, and most of what we're buying is obviously uh, the mediums and the lows. So a skew away from certainly highest ESG risk, risk issues. Uh, in our standard products, we don't do that. Um, so even if it's very high, if it's got a great yield, we'll include it. So the ESG products tend to go further uh, in terms of embedding research. Uh, in terms of screening, um, the right-hand side, again, um, I'm sure we circulate these slides, but uh, has a long list of things we actually screen out. Um, most managers and most products screen out the first, or certainly the first one of controversial weapons. Tobacco is pretty common as well. We do it across um, most of our products. Uh, the extra ones in ESG uh, are really around um, climate, I guess, in a way, um, for this particular fund. So it is really looking at um, thermal coal, uh, it's oil sands, Arctic drilling, fossil fuels, uh, all these type of things where the carbon footprints are quite high. Uh, we, we minimize or take out um, in some way. And certainly for a lot of our investors, when they think about the ES and the G, uh, the E uh, is certainly where they've been focused of late. So there is a sense, uh, which is where we'll finish, uh, on having a carbon footprint, which is a lot lower um, than what they actually would have had. And so again, different products design things differently. This particular product is designed uh, in one way to have a much lower um, carbon footprint. Um, in terms of thinking about, um, and I mentioned this earlier, um, how do we change the, the targets if um, we're taking more ESG into account? So um, as a generalism, the better the ESG, the lower the yield. Uh, and so if I want to give clients more ESG, I'm going to have to take something off the yield. Um, it's interesting, other managers have, have not done that. Uh, they've gone out, um, so they have a standard product and ESG product and just said the same target, same risk, same um, credit rating, same everything. Uh, in our view, I mean, that's probably a little bit disingenuous to do that. The, the reality is um, if, you, if you wanna maintain the same target, you have to take a little bit more credit risk uh, or you have a lower target and the same credit risk. You, you can't have everything. Um, what this shows, and, um, and we've got another paper in the works, this one's um, probably about a month away, um, but it, 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 what it does, it, it, it's similar to the other yield distribution one, as you can see, but it's slightly different. So this one, uh, this particular chart says, I'm going to look at global high yield uh, again. Uh, I'm going to map the ESG scores. Um, so um, this is on MSCI data. Everything on MSCI ESG is between zero and 10. Uh, and this gives you a sense of um, the ESG scores for all the issuers. Um, so, um, it, sorry, uh, whoops. So it looks like the other one, but it's actually ESG scores. Um, the green line says for each of those buckets of ESG scores, um, what is the average yield? And we can plot it and not surprisingly, you get a downward sloping line. And what that tells you is the better the ESG score, um, the lower the yield. And there's a little rule of thumb uh, over there in that box in green on the right hand side. So if you want to take your ESG score based on MSCI data um, from a four to a five or a five to a six, so up one or a 10% improvement, um, you're knocking off about 20 basis points uh, in, in terms of yield for actually, for actually doing that. So last couple of things. Um, so the carbon um, and carbon footprints uh, are complicated. 
Um, there's a there's a paper um, which I wrote last year on um, on uh, bluebay.com, uh, which um, goes into some detail about how we calculate them, uh, and uh, it's it's improved a lot in terms of the data we can actually get. Um, so on the left hand side, um, this is a snapshot from the paper. Uh, if you look at energy companies or if you look at banks, um, the, the way the ratings work, this is MSCI, um, although it says illustrative, um, they, they give um, different weightings to different things. Um, and so, and even within a sector like BP, Exxon, um, Total, uh, all these things have quite different weightings. So you really have to understand how it's calculated. One negative about how it's calculated is this text on the right hand side. So the... Um, the metric I don't love um, is, is on, in terms of carbon footprint is for corporates, where you work out the carbon footprint per $1 million sales. Uh, and the example I give is um, if the oil price doubles, <laughs> you have to sell half as much oil uh, to make the same amount of 1 million, so the same amount of revenue. So it looks like your emissions are actually falling. So for all the energy companies we own, as the oil price goes up, the way that the market calculates uh, emissions in terms of carbon intensity, it looks like it's improving. And, and if the oil price goes down, it's the opposite. Um, so it's not a great way um, to do it. And I'm sure the thinking um, will improve this. It's just a highlight. There's a few interesting thinking, thinking in there. It's called Carbon for Beginners uh, on bluebait.com. Uh, and, and last three slides for me. So um, comparing Mac ESG versus standard Mac, I just want to give you a sense. And, and again, this is true uh, of not everybody, um, but a lot of managers who've gone down this route. Uh, you're typically taking a little bit off the target. So cash plus four to six on a standard strategy, cash plus four to five. And in terms of credit rating, uh, it's a little bit higher in the standard one, as you can see on the right versus double B. So double B, double B plus. So, so again, there's no magic in markets. If we are going to have a safer portfolio with more ESG, uh, you're going to take a little bit more return, or if you're going to try and keep that return up, you're going to take a little bit more um, credit risk. So that's the way um, that relationship works. Um, last two slides. Uh, in terms of expected allocation, I'll, I'll, I'll skip over this one. Um, the, the hardest bit um, to get great ESG scores is actually in the emerging market. So what this compares is on the right hand side of standard strategy we saw earlier. Well, what does an ESG strategy do? The biggest difference is emerging markets you can see in the middle. So emerging markets have typically the worst ESG scores. So if you want to get a better ESG score, reducing the amount of emerging markets is certainly the easiest way to do it. Uh, and the very last thing um, before I stop is really thinking about carbon um, footprint. So uh, a lot of clients interested in this, uh, what this does is a lot of data, but again, on the right-hand side of standard strategy, on the left-hand side, the ESG version of the strategy. Uh, and if you just look at the, the, the big numbers, um, what you can see is you, you get a lot lower carbon footprint in an ESG product, which a lot of investors are looking for. So, uh, so again, uh, I won't run through the detail, but just there to give you a sense uh, of those differences. Um, so I will stop there uh, and I will click on stop share uh, if I can. And I realize I've probably talked for far too long, DJ, so apologies, uh, but very happy. Um, hopefully that wasn't too much information. I know there was a lot of different things, all the things we think are interesting. Very happy to, to take any questions if there are any. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this was very, very uh, informative session. Maybe we had one question uh, in a chat box. So this is, uh, you know, when you talked about the weightages, uh, are these weightages, uh, uh, sorry, the average uh, average yield? So is it a weighted average yield or is it average yield? So meaning it's weighted by market value? Um, they're, they're typically weighted average um, yields. So, so when we calculate a yield for an asset class, it, it is weighted by the components of it. Um, so, so it's not every bond in that index has a weighting of one. You, you are looking at a proper weighted average to calculate everything. Okay, there's a question uh, by Ziad that it is being promoted that on the in the long run, one of the main reasons for ESG integration is uh, recognizing that responsible investment can reduce risk and enhance returns. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So it, it depends on your time horizon. So in and and it depends whether it's equities or bonds. So um, in the bond market, the um, for most of the bonds we buy, the cash flows are contractual. So it doesn't really matter what happens on ESG. Uh, if as long as it doesn't default, I, I, I get my cash flows from the bond. Now it does depend on what price I bought the bond, and uh, that can be impacted by ESG. Uh, and generally, a company with improving ESG um, that will be reflected in some way um, in those bond prices. Um, but the the simple reality is in in the world of bonds, if I want to do greater ESG, I'm actually going to reduce the yield of my fund uh, in some way. And the, and the reason is it's a safer portfolio. 
So if I buy something safer, it, it is you know less less risk than less return. In the long run, um, you would expect companies with better ESG to do better uh, and survive, and ones with worse ESG to do worse. And so that's absolutely true. Um, it, it's it's clearer probably in the equity market where you're discounting all future dividends. So uh, in a world of non-contractual cash flows, uh, it, it's probably more stark. Uh, where a, a company with bad ESG, well, if you, if you invest in an ESG equity fund, uh, you would expect that to be more, um, perhaps more reflected uh, in returns than perhaps it would be in a bond run, uh, in a bond fund, I should say, in the short run. So um, short running bonds, um, all other things kept equal, more ESG uh, is generally less return. Uh, in, the, in the long run, that's probably less true. Uh, and in equity markets, it, it should work both times, if that answers the question. Yes, uh, thank you, it does. Uh, perhaps uh, last question for my side. So on slide 14, you know, you talked about the probability of default. So let's say, uh, you know, when we move from uh, double B to double B minus, the default probability moves uh, from 119 basis point to 195 basis point, right? By assuming excess risk, uh, are investors compensated by excess return, given where markets are now? Um, yes, so, so they are. Um, and so on, on that page 14 where I showed that, that, that is absolutely a lot of long run average. And as I said, there's a lot of variation over time. So at the moment, if you charted, all these numbers would be, would be significantly lower. Um, so if there's a time to take credit risk, um, it, it's probably now. Yeah, one thing we always think about is are you compensated correctly? And um, the, um, the reality of, of the way it works, and this is probably more complicated than I would have included today, but um, if you think about that page 14, um, a relevant question is, where am I the most overcompensated? Uh, and the answer is actually investment grade. So the yields you get in investment grade versus the probability of default make that very, very attractive in terms of a ratio. Uh, and as you go down in credit quality, um, if you go all the way down to the bottom, you're probably only fairly compensated, but there's no excess compensation. However, uh, at the very top, uh, in terms of investment grade, your, your overall return is pretty low. Uh, and as you come down, it, it gets bigger, the return, but your excess compensation becomes lower. So there's really a balancing point which, which Max sits at, which says just outside investment grade, uh, I'm getting reasonably overcompensated for these actual risks of default, but I'm not facing you know, material default risk uh, in my portfolio. And that's why a lot of investors focus there. Uh, the reason as a business we split out a lot of our distressed funds is so investors going into those know these are risky. Uh, there's a material chance of default in a lot of the things we hold. Um, you can get great returns, but there's also greater risk. So yeah, every time you go down a notch in credit quality, you are taking you know, an extra chance in not getting your money back. The job of a good credit manager effectively is to bet against that matrix is say, uh, this particular issuer, the market thinks is you know, B minus. Uh, we've done all our analysis. We think over a three-year view, it's going to meet all its cash flows, and we think it's a great investment. That that's effectively how active bond management works. Sure, I'll take another question uh, in the chat box. So, uh, you know, do you guys promote the ESG compliant asset? I mean, the question is: Is it uh, driven by the client demand? Yeah. What is the future of this asset class? Yeah, it, it is absolutely driven um, by client demand. And, uh, and, and we have different types of clients and uh, as, as with most businesses. So uh, we manage um, quite a bit of money on behalf of um, government or government type entities uh, where um, by legislation, they're forced to do more uh, on ESG. And so that, that's what is behind it. Certainly a lot of managers launching these types of products. Um, we have corporates of all different types, uh, corporates, some embracing ESG uh, and, and some, some much less so. Uh, I, I think in, in the fullness of time, I think what will happen is more investors will embrace ESG. Uh, it'll become more mainstream. And in 10 years time, we won't have uh, a standard product and an ESG product. We'll just have one. Uh, and I think that'll be true sure. of others as well. So I, th I think we're in a transition phase, which probably lasts five years, uh, where managers like us have an ESG version to make it clear we're doing more on ESG. Uh, but over time, um, everything will do more ESG and it'll all morph. I, I think it'll all morph into one. Um, so it would be less confusing in 10 years' time than it is today. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, well, there are no further questions, Evler. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues at CFA Emirates, I would like to thank you very much for presenting today. I think this was very insightful and thought provoking indeed. Uh, thank you to all our members for dialing in. I hope uh, you enjoyed the discussion today. And thank you very much, Evie, for your help in organizing uh, this webinar.